principles that Paul gave us about spiritual stability. And of course, uh, some of you may not have been here, but you know, the first principle was about harmony, uh, spiritually being in harmony with the church and God having unity and harmony is sometimes two different things. And I tell people at their wedding sometimes, you know, you can tie two catch tails together, throw them over a clothesline, you got unity, but you don't have much harmony. And so uh, two people can have, be united in marriage but that doesn't mean they're going to have harmony in their marriage. And so harmony is something that you have to work at. And so it is with the church, um, uh, you know, we can have unity in a building. We can all be together in the building, but that doesn't mean that we have harmony in the church. And so uh, spiritual stability is being able to have harmony with your brothers and your sisters. Thank God. And that takes overlooking each other. Sometimes that takes putting up with our differences to be able to have harmony in the church and Jesus said by this shall all men know that you're my disciples that you can love one another and so it's a process and it's a it's a challenge sometimes to love uh, some people um, so you just have to understand harmony is what God is is one of the principles of spiritual stability and the second thing was virtually was keeping your joy and God and in the scripture uh, we it talks a lot about rejoicing matter of fact Paul commanded us to rejoice in the Lord. Now, the way that you can rejoice is to remember that you're rejoicing in the Lord. You may not be rejoicing about your problems and your troubles, but you can rejoice in the Lord. And um, so there are a, a lot of times that we can't just rejoice about the way that things are going. But we can always get to the house of God. We can always get in His presence and begin to rejoice in the Lord. The third principle is learning to... Um, Accept less than what you feel you deserve. Hey, God, don't um, live to be um, patted on the back because sometimes you may not get patted on the back. And so I'm not going to live for God. Uh, if people appreciate me, will I appreciate it? But if they don't appreciate me, I'm still going to live for God. Hey, God, and so we can't uh, expect them to, you know, when people do pat you on the back, you need to get over it, you know, and not let it go to your head. And don't take your, yourself too serious. And God, learn to be content in whatever state uh, you find yourself in. And um, because if you feel you're, you're being overlooked and underappreciated, uh, don't let it cause you to get bitter. Don't let it cause you to get down. And God, and definitely don't let it cause you to quit because it doesn't matter. Uh, I just want to go to heaven. I want to be saved. And um, I... I Talk to some people, and they say, well, I don't want to go to church because everybody is uh, disappointed in me or everybody uh, uh, don't like me or whatever other little excuses they make. And I try to remind people, I'm not going to church for you. Thank God. I, I mean, it's nice if you like me, but whether you like me or not, I still want to go to church. I still want to live for God. And the fourth principle was rest in the Lord. They can learn how to relax, learn how to uh, rest in the Lord because this life is short. And Jesus is coming soon, and so the big picture is what really matters. And if you know the Lord is near, and God, you can um, be anxious for nothing because you can know that all of this is going to pass away. The problems with many, uh, their, their God is just too small. And so when they have troubles and problems, it overwhelms them. But sometimes you need to remember that I've got a big God, and He's big enough to handle all of my problems, and so I just have to lean on Him. If you trust God, you can can trust him with uh, to work everything out. So whatever you're going through, God is able to work it out. If you'll just kind of trust him. So tonight we want to kind of pick up from there. That was kind of a quick review of the, the first four principles. The fifth principle is um, uh, reacting to problems with a with a thankful prayer. In Philippians chapter four and verse number six says this: Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto the Lord. Because when trouble comes, there is no better way to face it than just to begin to get in prayer and just begin to give thankful praise to God. And um, the Bible says that in everything, give thanks. So when troubles come, and God, God wants you to, he, sometimes he just wants to see what kind of attitude you're going to have uh, and whether you will just keep a right spirit no matter what uh, comes or goes. I don't want to be like the little boy that Paul Harvey talked about um, in one of his um, clips one time, and the little boy was praying, and he said, Lord, please help my brother to stop beating me up. Hey, God. And he said, 
Uh, by the way, Lord, this is the third time I've asked you. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to remind the Lord that, hey, I've been praying about this for a long time. But don't quit praying and don't, don't cut God short because the secret to, to powerful praying is just being thankful and being able to see that God knows best. Sometimes I think I know what's best. I'm praying about some things right now, and I'm telling the Lord, Lord, I would really like for you to do this, but in case uh, I don't see something, maybe there's a, maybe you got a better way to work this out. And so if you got a better way, I'm going to trust you, but I really think this is the best way to work it out. But so far, he hadn't agreed with me, so maybe he's got a better way. So I'm going to just believe there's a better way. And so just to trust him. Thank God. So the trouble comes to comes and goes because God, uh, we just have to know he's in control. Um, you know, there, there was a little caption of two penguins, and they were standing side by side, and uh, one of them was being swallowed by this big old fish, and the other one was just saying, remember, you know, God's in control. Thank God. You know, it's easy to tell your friends how to deal with their problems and their troubles and things, but when you're going through it, it's kind of a little different. You know, when you're the one getting swallowed by the fish, it's, uh, you know, you wouldn't want, and I know God's in control, but I sure would like some relief. So we have to be careful that we um, don't make it easy. Think everybody else ought to be having it easy. Thank God. And the way uh, of giving Thanksgiving works, uh, really, I think, is probably seen the best um, in Jonah. You know, when Jonah was running from God and ultimately found himself in the belly of the whale, um, this is what the Bible says, the waters can pass me about even to my soul, the deep closes me around about, the weeds are wrapped about my head, I went down to the bottom of the mountain, the earth with uh, her bars was about me forever, yet hast thou brought up my life from uh, corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came unto thee, uh, unto thy holy place. Now this is Jonah, of course he was running from God, and you know the story, they throwed him overboard because he told them to throw him overboard because he was the problem, and sure enough, as soon as they throwed him overboard, the storm, storm passed, and the fish that God had prepared for him swallowed him up, and um, so... I understand that he was in the belly of that whale for three days. Now, I don't know what was going on for three days in the belly of that whale, but finally, after three days, he decides he's going to pray. And so, uh, it wouldn't have taken me that long to be praying, I know, but I don't know why, why it took him so long to pray. But for some reason, and, and what kind of prayer do you think Jonah would pray with sea reeds wrapped around his head in the belly of a whale Hey, God, I know what I would have been praying is, God, I'm sorry, uh, help me get out of here, and uh, I, I forgive me of everything, and if I'm fixing to die, I want everything to be right. But, you know, that wasn't the prayer that Jonah prayed. In verse number 9, this is the way that he began to pray. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray that thy uh, pay the vows that I have uh, vowed, Salvation is of the Lord. He said, I'm going to give the Lord some thanks. And there is no better way when you're in trouble and when you're having problems to just start thanking the Lord. Instead of, he already knows all your troubles. I mean, Jonah didn't have to tell him he's in the belly of the well. God put him in the belly of the well. He knew. But Jonah was trying to get God's attention. And when you want to get God's attention, and God, the best thing you can do is just start praising God and, um, and just push your troubles apart. Side, push your fears aside and just start praising God. And when he started praising God, uh, the Bible says in verse number 10, The Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon dry land. Thank God. Now, if you want to get an answer to your prayers, you just start praising God. And you'll be amazed at how that God will respond to a thanksgiving prayer instead of a, a, a woe is me prayer and to a poor old me. And, and why is everybody against me instead of just really just understanding that, hey, God, you're able. And so you just begin to give thanks and praise him. And so thankful prayer. Philippians 4 and 7 also gave us this promise. If we will thank God in prayer, then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. So as you learn to be spiritually stable, 
And God, you get the peace that passeth understanding. When you really learn how to just walk with God, and no matter what comes and no matter what goes, when the, because the real test is to see if you can trust God even when everything is going wrong, when everything's not going your way, no matter how um, impossible it seems, you just keep on praising God, then the peace of God that passeth understanding comes to you. And our world is um, busy, you know, trying to make everything perfect. And everybody's trying to get everything just right so that they can be happy. I'm glad I don't have to have everything right to get happy. Praise God. It can, everything can be one going wrong, and I can still be happy. And so everybody, everything, thank God, trust in me. Thank God. And you can be happy in whatever circumstances you might find yourself in. And so all of us are at every stage of life, thank God. And life has its stages. And we are everyone, if we don't die, we're going to pass through all of those stages. And, and some of us, we still have um, unknown places that we're going to wind up and unknown chapters that are still to be written in our lives. And, uh, but I'm not going to dread tomorrow. I'm going to anticipate that God is going to be there tomorrow just like He was there yesterday. And so whatever I have to go through, His grace is going to be sufficient for me. And we come to um, this verse that, uh, that it was all leading up to. And that's uh, the sixth principle. And that is learning how to think right. Because every problem and every battle that you fight is the biggest battles are right up here. Thank God. And if you can learn how to think right, then everything else is going to be all right. And so this is what uh, Paul said in kind of summing up this part of it. In verse number 8, Finally, brethren, what things soever are true and whatsoever things are honest, and whatsoever things are just and whatsoever things are pure and whatsoever things are lovely and whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, just think on these things. He's God. And so there is a place um, where that you can understand that the final word, thank God. He says to just sum everything up, he's God. And the key to spiritual stability is controlling how you think. If you can control your thoughts, you're going to be able to control how that you walk with God. Because your mind is what uh, it, it takes to... Uh, Make decisions. It's in your mind whether you decide what you're going to do or not going to do. And, and we all live in a world that is full of unhappy people. Uh, you, everywhere you go, people are unhappy. And um, many to, to the point that they take all kind of medications to try to make them happy. And others, you know, they go to psychiatrists try to get uh, to figure out why they're unhappy. And normally, you know, they try to dig up your past and all your failures and all your sins and all the uh, ways that you were mistreated and all those things. And, you know, I haven't seen many people when it's all said and done that that did a whole lot of good. But the Bible says God, the way to peace of mind is to maintain an attitude of just a positive and some right thinking. Thank God. So it says that we are to think on things that are honest, and we're to think on things that are pure, and we're to think on things that are lovely, and we're to think on things that are good report. Thank God. One place Paul said, for forgetting those things that are behind. Thank God. At baptism, thank God, we, our, our past was buried. And so you don't have to let your past be your tormentor today. And, um, you know, Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Uh, most of you probably haven't even heard of that book, but at one time it was a very famous book. But he was not the author of positive thinking. Positive thinking uh, was way before he ever uh, thought about uh, positive thinking. So the, the Bible is full of positive thinking. How that if you can, whatever way you think, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so the habit of becoming um, thankful and having a thankful heart is learning how to control your thoughts. That is why they say that um, concerning your mind, if you put garbage in your mind, then you're going to get garbage out of your mind. But if you put good things in your mind, you're going to get good things out of your mind. And so you are the product of your, your thinking. That's why you have to control the material that you look at. That's why you have to control the things that you think about. That's why you have to control the things that influence you. Because we all are the product of, of what we allow to come into us and, and to, into our mind and things. And so um, people don't... Ask, um, is it true anymore or is it right anymore? They just ask, will it work? Does it feel good? And that's what people are looking for. They just want to know, does it work? 
does it feel good? And God, that's why people take pills, and that's why people um, do a lot of immoral things, because it's all about feeling. They're not worried about the truth. They're not worried about doing right. And I want to uh, build my walk with God on what is true and what is right, not just what feels good. Even in religion, there, there is feel-good religion. You know, we just want you to feel good. Well, you do get to feeling good, but there's more to it than just feeling good. There's times you have to walk by faith and God. And, you know, in, a, in our computer uh, television world, people want to just be able to push a remote control and get an answer to all of their questions. And people are fast getting to the place that they don't know how to think for themselves. Matter of fact, um, there's an election going on uh, some of these days, one of these days. And you know where most people are trying to make their decision? They, they listen to news and they decide, well, does the news say that he's good or does the news say that he's bad? Does the news say that this one's good or this one's bad? And so uh, well, what does the opinion polls say? And so most people are going to make their decision on what somebody else tells them is their decision. And so they'll decide what they're going to do because whatever they tell them. Um, and, of course, you know, you're blessed if you don't have a television, you don't have this problem. But, but most people, you know what they buy in the stores? They buy what they're told on the TV to buy that, you know, Post hostage or whatever there is, um, all staff or whatever there is out there. I think they don't even make that beer anymore, but that was an old timey beer and things. But uh, but that's they buy whatever you know they're told to buy, and and ultimately, it, uh, educators say that uh, people are not being able to be educated because a pro and this was a professor, a Paul Robertson, a professor at Stanford University, wrote an article saying that TV cannot educate says the only way to learn is by reading because when you put your child in front of a TV or some DVD, you are not helping them to think. And God, the professor says the worst kind of uh, education is TV education, thank God, because it is contradictory because he says it cannot educate. Pictures don't create thoughts. They just give, uh, grab your emotions. When you read, your mind has to think and envision and what you are reading. And so you can think um, over the, the words and you're, as you read them and meditate on them and you're, you review them and et cetera. But TV doesn't give you time to think. Thank God. It just throws pictures at you and therefore there is, it's all an emotional thing and makes you feel good or it gives you an emotional fix and they are not... Uh, consist uh, uh, really able to help you. And that is why that we have to study to show ourselves approved. That's why you need to study the Word of God and you need to read the Word of God because there's power in the studied Word of God. And it's about how, it's not about how you feel, thank God. Although you do get some feelings in living for God, there's a wonderful feeling in the in feeling of the Holy Ghost. But even after the infilling of the Holy Ghost, thank God, you can't just ride on the experience. You have to really uh, get truth in your heart because feelings should never override the truth. It doesn't matter how good it feels. What does the Bible say is right and what does the Bible say is wrong? And that is why that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And also the Bible says that we are to be able to give a reason for the hope that lies in us. You ought to be able to explain why you believe what you believe and why you live the way that you live. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, you get God in you. And thank God He wants to give your, uh, get in your mind and He wants to give you the ability to see His truth. Matter of fact, the Bible says the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all truth. And so you're given a, a whole new way to think, thank God. And so everything seems different after that you get the Holy Ghost. That's why Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Uh, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Or to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is is not subject to the laws of God, neither uh, indeed can be. In other words, in my flesh, I can't please God. The only way I can please God is to walk in the Spirit. The principle of the, the spiritual stability is, is, is thinking on 
right things or you have to be a, have a godly attitude. You have to do, you have to think on godly things. If we do, um, uh, we can be uh, strong in the Lord. Thank God. And if we don't, then we become depressed, we become worried, we feel fear, we feel anxiety, thank God. And so really the, the flesh is always uh, enmity to the, to the things of God. And that is why the Bible says even after you get the Holy Ghost, you can't just depend on that initial experience. But Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thank God that you might uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so what he's really saying is you just got to keep getting your mind touched and having that spiritual flow. And it's almost like, uh, you know, having to get a fix every once in a while. People that are addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs or whatever, they have to get their fix every once in a while. Well, spiritually, he says, you know, you've got to get addicted to the things of the Spirit and you've got to uh, get your mind renewed uh, that you can prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so it's a constant process going on. Verse number 8 of, of Philippians chapter 4 says, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true and whatsoever things are honest and whatsoever things are just and whatsoever things are pure, there be any virtue, there be any praise, to think on these things. And so uh, the, the thinking is so important in your walk with God. If you will learn to think on good things, it's going to bring blessings back to you. And then the last point about spiritual stability is, is spiritually stability through obedience. Somewhere in your walk with God, the ultimate is learning how to be obedient to the things of God. It's not enough to get the Holy Ghost. There is, uh, you have to be born again. A man must be born again of the water and the Spirit. So you have to be born again. But after that you're born again, then you've got to learn how to walk with God. And of course, like Romans um, 12 and 2 that we said, and be not conformed to the world. You have to change the way you live. You have to change the people you hang out with. You have to change the things that you put into your mind. And that is why that um, many of you, when you first got in church, uh, if you were like me, you know, the thing that you just couldn't get enough of the Word of God. I mean, you just wanted to understand. And I think the greatest um, thing is when you begin to personally get revelations out of the Word of God. When you personally open the Bible and nobody taught it to you, you just begin to see it. You know, you knew that they taught it, you heard them preach it, but you never really understood it for yourself. And I think one of the greatest revelations is when you can understand the mighty God in Christ that Jesus is God, and that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. And when you see that for yourself, I mean, you know, you might believe it, you might get baptized in Jesus' name, and you might know that it's right because of uh, the experience that you receive, but when you finally just open your own Bible and you personally see it for yourself and you say, I understand it now. Thank God. I was raised in Pentecost. I was in my first year Bible college. Or no, I really must first in a year and a half of Bible college, and I still was scared to have to debate the you know, oneness in the Trinity because they would throw me their two or three scriptures they had, and then I would just be dumbfounded, you know? I, didn't, I, I, know, I know there's one God, but I don't know how to answer your question. But, you know, the, the beautiful thing is, is that I personally got the revelation. My dad had the revelation. My pastors before my dad had the revelation, but I had to get it for myself. But once I got it for myself, there was, I could explain it to anybody, I could show anybody, and I can still today, um, I, you know, if you want to discuss the, the oneness of God, and we can just use the Bible, then, then I'll take you in a debate or whatever you want to do. And if we're going to have a bunch of other material, I don't know. But if we just use the Bible, thank God, I'm not afraid to debate anybody about the oneness of God. I'm not afraid to debate anybody about uh, the new birth experience. I know that if you believe the Bible, if you look at the Bible, I've even had people say, well, I know the Bible says it, but I don't believe it. You know, that's not the way I believe it. Well, you know, that's you, but I'm telling you, this Bible says it, you might ought to believe it because that's the way it is. And so, but you have to settle things. And the only way you can settle those things is you have to study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. And so uh, spiritual stability comes through being obedient. When you learn how to be obedient the Word of God, obedient to the things of God, that's how that 
you get your stability in him. And Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 9 says, those things which we have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Thank God. And so all the knowledge in, in the world is for us to, if, if will not do us any good if we don't act on it. That's just like I know people that uh, you can meet them on your jobs and work with them, and they can tell you about God and how to live for God, what you need to do. I've even had people get saved because I was working with this guy that was a backslider, and he told me, I'm not living it, but this is the way you go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, this is what you need to do. Thank God. And so it's not enough to know it. You've got to act on it. So there's people that know the truth. There's people that know what it takes to be saved, but they're still going to hell because it's not enough to know the truth. You've got to act on the truth, and you've got to be obedient to the truth. And so uh, you can, um, you know, uh, have the knowledge but still not act on it. It's kind of like the lady, you know, the policeman uh, stopped her for running a stop sign. And he said, lady, didn't you see that stop sign? She said, yes, sir, I've seen the stop sign. He said, oh. But she said, but I didn't see you, thank God. And so what she was saying is that stop sign don't mean as much as seeing you. If I'd have seen you, I wouldn't have run it. But because I didn't see you, I ran it. Thank God. And that's kind of the way some people, you know, look at the Word of God. As long as they can get by, well, that's all they're worried about. It. But someday, you know, the chief judge is going to look at you and say, didn't you know? Thank God. And that's what you're going to be judged by is what you know. He's got, I've even had people say, well, I don't understand some things. But don't worry so much about what you don't understand. Why don't you do what you do understand? And God, if you'll live what you do understand, it'll probably help you to understand the things you don't understand. And so some people just um, use that as an excuse. Well, I, I can't understand everything. Well, do you understand some things? Why don't you do what you do understand? And as you do that, then knowledge will come to you to do what uh, you need to do. And so obedience must become a heart action. It has to be from the heart. And Paul says... Now, the things which we have both learned of me and you've received of me and you've heard of it and you've seen it, now I want you to do it. Thank God. You know, all that's of the process. But the ultimate is, is you've got to do it. Thank God. There's people that know that they should pay their tithes. There's people that know that they should be faithful to church. There's people that know that, um, you know, they need to be baptized in Jesus' name. But until they do those things, it's not doing them much good. And so Paul calls for them to practice what he has been uh, preaching to them and teaching to them. And God, and this practice means to, to act on what you already know. You know, we say that um, doctors practice medicine, and we say that lawyers practice law, and we don't mean that the doctor is practicing when he's doing open-heart surgery, you know. We don't, I mean, I don't want a doctor practicing open-heart surgery on me. I want him to already have done some open-heart surgery. I want him to work on some pigs and to work on some other things before he works on me. But we say he's practicing medicine. But that doesn't mean that he's never done an open-heart surgery. Thank God. And so it is with what Paul is saying here. When he says practice these things that I've been teaching you, he means practice what you already know to do. You know how to do this. And God, it's not like practicing to learn how to play the piano or practicing to learn how to play ball, but it's practicing what you already have learned. You've learned these things. You've been taught these things. And it'll start doing it is what he's saying. You, you know how to do it. You know what it takes. Now practice what I'm telling you to do. And so the reason so many uh, so-called Christians struggle in living for God is that they, they are not obeying the Word of God. And so they struggle. And um, I've always explained it this way. If you live easy for God, it's going to be hard to live for God. But if you live hard for God, it's going to be easy to live for God. And so if you want to live for God, you live hard for God, and it's easy to live for God. I don't, you know, a lot of people tell me, that's so hard. Well, that's because you got your mind in the wrong place, because it is not hard to live for God. If you will live hard for God, if you will do the things that the Word of God teaches you to do, it's going to be easy to live for God. And so you are the one that's got to walk in the Spirit. You are the one that's got to uh, seek uh, for His joy. You're the one that's got to let the fruit of the Spirit work in life. You're the one that's got to study the Word of God to show yourself the fruit. You will have to, the one that has to know the truth, hey God, and you have to know 
that what is good and what is lovely and what is of a good report. And when the one that, um, uh, if you want to be his disciple, then all you have to do is to do what he says to do. And Jesus said, you know, if you do the things that I say to do, then you are my disciples. Thank God. And so after you receive the Holy Ghost, thank God, if you don't become spiritually stable, then what you're going to have is just a, a, a wonderful experience with God but you're never going to really know what it is to live for God because um, it's the flesh, and if we let the flesh control us, and it's going to be hard to walk in the Spirit. Second Corinthians 10 and 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that is altered itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so what he says is when you really get to walking uh, in the Spirit, thank God, and not minding the things of the flesh, then you're able to cast down all these imaginations. You're able to um, uh, come against every high thing that is altered itself against the knowledge of God, and you're able to bring into captivity every thought that's disobedient to the things of God. And so you still are in the flesh, but you don't live after the flesh. And so we're, we're not talking about divine flesh, but we're talking about flesh that has been submitted to the Spirit of God because spiritual growth is developed for uh, developing godly habits. So you have to get some godly habits. You have to learn how to read your Bible every day. You have to learn how to pray every day. You have to get some godly habits. The outstanding habits of the great men of God is that they learned how to discipline themselves. And living for God is all about discipline, how to uh, have virtue and how to have, um, you know, uh, patience and how to have long suffering and all of the fruit of the Spirit. It comes by disciplining yourselves to walk after the Spirit. Someone um, called me Friday, uh, well, a long time ago now, uh, and said that, you know, they were so excited because they had finally been able to overcome something that was always besetting them. They, you know, the Bible says there's sins and there's weights that does so easily beset us. And all of us have things that are our struggles, you know, that we have to work, uh, watch after and watch because they are what we struggle with. And you have to learn how to, when you overcome those things, you really know you want a great victory. He's got some of you, when you first came to God, it was cigarettes. Some of you, when we first came to God, it was alcohol. Some of you, when we first came to God, it was cursing and saying bad words. And I've had people call me up and say, well, I just lost the Holy Ghost. I just um, said a bad word. Praise God. No, you don't lose the Holy Ghost that easy. Thank God you say, God, forgive me. Praise God, I'm sorry. And you learn how to, you know, watch it. Because uh, every time you repent, uh, you know, it makes it easier not to do it again. It's kind of like uh, when you, um, you know, wrong a brother and you go to that brother and you make it right. Hey, God, it's not a fun thing to do. So you realize, hey, I don't want to have to do that again, so I'm going to try not to wrong anybody because to make it right is kind of hard. And so you have to learn that um, it, it's just learning how to just hang in there and, and continue to live for God. And so uh, the seven things to, to living for God, the last one is to be obedient to the things of God. Let's all stand. I think our time's about to run out. And so... Um, so Paul just went through all of those things that we need to do. You have to remember he that is willing and obedient is going to eat the good. Thank God. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Jesus said, he that heareth my sayings and doeth them, that is the one that is my disciple. And so the first thing is, is that a man must be born again. Thank God. And that's why when Paul met the people at Ephesus, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And so he helped them with that process. And you know the story. He baptized them in Jesus' name, laid his hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost. But most of us don't know what happened after that, and that's in verse number 8. And then it says, And he um, went into the synagogue and spake boldly uh, for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Hey God, it wasn't enough that they got Jesus' name, baptism, got the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. He be began to uh, dispute. That meant he kind of had some debates with them over things they thought was one way, and he had to show them a more perfect way, and then he had to persuade them.